I was a funny kid. Um, when I was younger, um, I was kind of brought up with my mum and my sister. I didn't really have a male influence. And I was quite a, a near-hearted young man. You know, I used to get upset. I, I even got bullied by quite a bit. Not physical, but just kind of mental bullying. And when I was about 14, I kind of started getting into the karate and you know I wanted to kind of toughen myself up a little bit but I just had this idea to join the army and I'm just kind of one of these people once I get an idea in my head that is it I'm just going to go for it and 14 years old I decided right bollocks to this I'm joining the military you know what I mean my mum's a little bit obviously concerned about it but she's not the kind of person who would say no and that was it I didn't take school very seriously from on there. I was bunking all the while. I didn't really care. My mind was made up. And at 16 years old, I decided that I was old enough to go and fill this, the thing in there. I think at school age, I could have joined slightly early, but I didn't. And I ended up going to lowest off recruiting service, done all the paperwork. And I wasn't really academically very great. I was dyslexic, so I wasn't very good at these tests. And I ended up having the choice of either joining the tankies or the infantry. And I thought, I want to be in the infantry. So as a very young lad at 16, I entered at a place called JIB Shawncliffe, Junior Infantry Battalion Shawncliffe. Uh, that's on down at the coast on Folkestone. And that's where it all kind of began, you know. I mean, I can remember leaving home. I think my mum had a photograph of me. I was very tearful, very uh, nervous, but also excited for what the bloody hell have I just got myself into. Anyway, I got the long train journey down. Everywhere was fine until we got on the uh, London train. And I started meeting up with other lads that were going down there. And everyone was quite jovial, but the closer and closer we got to this location, everyone got really, really quiet. And then we turned up at, um, oh, I think it was Folkestone South or whatever the state, Folkestone West or whatever. And there was an NCO stand out. I can remember Corporal Pierce, Free Royal Anglin. and he was all dressed up as number twos. And God, did everyone go quiet. We were absolutely shitting it by that point. Anyway, so we, we got on the coaches, good old-fashioned military coaches, and trundled down to uh, St. John's Moor Barracks in um, Folkestone, or Shawncliffe. And um, how can I say, to be perfectly honest, the first six weeks I found an absolute nightmare. Drill was, oh my word, what is this? Um... I had no coordination <laughs> and I really didn't enjoy it much and you know I had lots of thoughts of chucking in the towel but I'm a resilient bugger, I'm a stubborn bugger and no much matter how much I hated it, I stuck it out um, and yeah you, you know and it got to a point once my mindset started changing, I started becoming more of a soldier. I kind of really enjoyed it. And we had to go and do a second part of a train, which was down in um, Royston, Bassingbourne Barracks, where they filmed Full Metal Jacket. When we were there, they still had the assault course, but we weren't allowed to go on it. We were absolutely busting to go on this bloody assault course. They wouldn't let us on it for health and safety because that was woodworm. And it felt really disappointing. But anyway, uh, there weren't really that long after they'd done the film Full Metal Jacket and within two weeks of Bassingbourne Mar Barracks I managed to break my foot. <laughs> I've got stress fractures right across my feet like the David Beckham in industry, injury, excuse me. And um, oh, I ended up getting back squatted for about six weeks and I was in something called Cohima platoon and you know and had to go and work all the way through there loads of spans all those horrible brutal exercises they want to because they want to keep you fit so you could fit back into training when i kind of recovered anyway um long story short is i passed out and i wanted to join the royal angling regiment 
why the Royal Anglian Regiment? Well, look, it's kind of thing is that I did want a bit of power. I hated the bloody heights. I cannot stand heights. Do I want a bit of boot neck? No, I don't like bloody water. So I thought, right, okay, we'll go Royal Anglian Regiment Infantry, local battalion. Funny enough, the battalion's called the Vikings because um, of its Nordic roots. Basically, the first battalion's catchment area is Norfolk, Suffolk, Cambridgeshire, uh, Lincolnshire. And, um, you know, we were based in Gibraltar. And that was my first post in Gibraltar. And that was not long after the um, Gibraltar Free, where um, the uh, members of the Provisional IRA thought that was a jolly good idea to... Uh, Plant a rather large bomb in a tourist area of uh, Gibraltar. They were going to try and take out the convent and the band, and uh, they got owned. And that was my first introduction. And I can remember doing stuff and um, certain operations where we get ITV, kind of, we're jumping out of the back of the vehicles and clamping down the island. So that was my first introduction to the battalion. Now, when you're in Gibraltar, it's like a bit of a holiday location. And, um, you know, either we'd get up at really early in the morning and we'd do area cleaning. Now, the, the routine was this. You would get up in the morning, you'd do area cleaning, you'd do a little bit of training, and you'd bin at about 12 o'clock in the afternoon because it'd get really hot. And then I, for the guys, would go and get the heads down or go down the swim pool or down the beach. Now and then, being young soldiers, we were horrible. And we would just go out on the Raz every night. So we'd go out at about 9, 10 o'clock at night, get absolutely smashed off your face, crawl back into barracks about night, 4 o'clock in the morning, put a head on the pillow, next thing some horrible individual will be waking us up and then they make us run up the rock of Gibraltar so the famous rock run and the next step so we used to have to do this they'd get us up we'd go run up the hill we'd all be ill we'd all be being throwing up over the edge and god knows what and on the way back because it's a really steep hill you know your trainers are on fire because you used to have these really sharp bends you oh my god you used to sprint down these things and you know and you kind of end up flying off the edge of the bloody rock but anyway, you got down to the bottom, you're fine, you're as right as rain, you'd have your breakfast, whatever, then you'd be like training, and then you'd just repeat the loop. And, you know, I mean, <laughs> that went on for quite a while. And then we kind of, that tour came to end. We used to go and just do silly things, like just used to bugger off to Morocco for the day or just skip over to Spain because it's just right on the border. But it's quite a boring posting really um and then we got kind of moved back to colchester hyderabad barracks and that's where we kind of got our first active tour coming along which was um south armar this was in 1989 and uh yeah we started training for our first active service tour in northern ireland and uh one of the first speeches we got about South Armagh was we were told that not all of us would be coming back. So anyway, I was in um, C Company uh, 11 platoon and um, that would have been our kind of like our operations company and we'd done all our training in um, Lidenhaif and Fetford and sort of like this uh, is called your, your, your NI training. Yeah, um, I can't remember the exact terms, it's such a long time ago. But anyway, um, August the 25th was my 19th birthday. And I've got a picture of me sitting in um, the car park at Hyderabad Barracks. And that very day, my 19th birthday, we were deployed to South Armagh in Northern Ireland. Um, I can't remember where we flew out from, but we turned up in Aldergrove Airport. And one of the... First things, because, you know, we were green. We were green troops and nervous. And that is that we were at Aldergrove Airport. There used to be this little old lady that used to meet all the soldiers at Aldergrove Airport, and she used to go and hand out Bibles. So you'd walk out and then this little lady, and she'd say a prayer for you, and she'd give you a Bible. You thought, shit, this shit's getting serious. 
and um, from that point on, we were we had to go. To, we were deployed to um, Besbrook Mill, and what happened? We'd get picked up at Old Grove in a big Chinook. We'd fly over, get dropped off outside the gates, and we'd walk up. And one of the very first things I ever saw, and it really stuck in my mind for a very long time, and there was a, a sanger at the top of the basin. On it was a message written by the unit we'd swapped with, and it said, be slack and you'll surely kiss your ass goodbye. So anyway, we, we, we turned up, we're an operations company. That just basically meant that they just whiz you anywhere in your uh, area of operations. And um, I can remember my very first patrol, and that was um, up at a place called the Cashel Locks near um, Silverbridge. And I had got these really old pair of combat trousers on. And basically what happens when you go around the island, they, they have these, these stone walls and they had these barbed wire fences. But because of the civilians didn't like us very much, they would put like four um, rows of barbed wire on. So they were like up against your chest. and. So basically we got into an art form of what we called uh, fence hopping and it's a bit of an art because when you're carrying like about a hundred pounds of kit on you and you're going over these fences and that it takes a little bit of practice but because this is my first patrol I wasn't really that practiced anyway so probably the very first fence I got to I stood on and the bloody thing collapsed and it ripped my combat trousers, my ankle all the way up to my groin thought great good start so anyway we're trying a little bit further so every time we came to a fence poor old mac you know catch his trousers a little bit more so by the time i'd ended up at this finished on this bloody patrol which was like about a good six seven hours it looked like i was wearing a bloody grass skirt no word of a lie on me ass hanging out you know what i mean i kept going past the civilians and flashing with me ass out and the, yeah, even they took it in good humor but um first patrol bloody nightmare you know he does have practically had nothing left in my trousers here on this barbed wire fence so that's my first call where i was tired really tired we'd just been trolling all day and i was absolutely shattered but um, that was my, kind of my first introduction into what the terrain is. They kind of shifting us around and um, spent a bit of time down Nuri. And uh, I think where my first kind of uh, close shave was we walked past a car bomb. And for some reason it wasn't triggered. They'd wedged in a few pounds of Semtex in this car bomb, and for some reason they, they didn't detonate it. They'd obviously bottled it. They'd uh, you had spooked them. There's obviously a patrol that was in their cut or in their escape route or something. But for some reason they never detonated that. And that's kind of like your first kind of little bit of a wake up call. I think that. Generally, there were little things happening here and there, a few mortar bombings, a few mortar attacks and that. But I think that, I think the first time we had to kind of deal with death was, um, um the, 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 the first time we had to deal with death was, was, uh, I think it was, uh, October, October the 25th and we were in the base and we heard the gunfire from about 10 miles away and uh, what had happened is that um, police were called out to a location a place called Balik and they were ambushed and basically what they'd done is had a pickup truck and they had like a, a Russian made 12.7 Dushka on the back of it, and they ambushed this police vehicle. I mean, one of the lads, he managed to get out, he was very lucky, but the other guy wasn't. And we, and we were called out on um, the cordon, and uh, we had to cordon the area. And um, the fire brigade, they, they, they couldn't put the fire out, so the, the poor lad in there was left burning. And that because of all the exploding ammunition in the vehicle and that. So basically we just just uh, 
looked at his corpse burning in the vehicle. You know, he had the, like the expression of terror on his face. Um, you, you know, you could see all his white teeth and everything. And that. poor lad. And um, that was one of the coldest mornings I could ever remember. Um, yeah, yeah, that was one of those beautiful, clear, frosty October mornings. Um, so beautiful, so picturesque. But then again, you know, there's some poor lad who has, has been uh, killed. Uh, Constable Michael Marshall, uh, 25 years old. You know what I mean? Uh, all these faces, utter waste of time and life. <laughs>